God. You may be seated. Make sure you grab the hand of someone nearby. Just say hello, welcome, and uh, thank them for being here today. All right, glad that you are here as we get started talking about family for the month of September. This is, I hope, going to be something that's beneficial to all of us. And the title of the lesson today is Fantastic Families, The Parents' Priority. The Parents' Priority. And this really is the kickoff lesson for our Family Matters Month. And if you're a parent, you know someone who is a parent, or if you had a parent... Would you agree that parenting can be somewhat difficult? Is that, is that an understatement? I, I mean, parenting can be downright challenging. In fact, I like what Mark Twain said. He said about parenting teenagers. Now, I don't have teenagers yet, so I don't know if he's right or not. Maybe you can help me with this. But here's what Mark Twain said. When they are 13, put them in a barrel and nail the lid shut and feed them through the knot hole. That was his advice. And he said when they're 16, cover the knot hole. That's... <laughs> That was kind of Twain's advice uh, for parenting. I'm not going to quite go that far today as we talk about the, the parents' priority, but I have to tell you, I have had more joy in parenting than, than I can ever begin to tell you. In fact, it wasn't too long ago that, that we were blessed to go with Dr. Chandler up to the mountains with the graduating seniors and spend some time with them. And it was just Cindy and I that went. We left the kids here with the in-laws, and, and, and it was great. We had a wonderful time, but the whole time we were like, well, the kids really would have liked to have done that. And, and man, wouldn't it be great if we came back with the kids and did this? And, and we started talking about, man, we don't know. We don't remember what we used to do before they came around. Uh, can anybody share in my struggle here? I mean, it's just amazing how much they, they just take over our lives. And that's not a bad thing. And so today we're going to talk about family matters. And we're going to start by talking about kids and parents. And if you are not yet a parent and one day will be, or if you are a parent, the question that I want to ask today is, what is our primary priority? What is the most important thing that you and I can do as parents for our kids? And I think the answer is this. Let, let me just throw this out there for you, and then we'll talk about it a little bit. A parent's priority is to gradually transfer a child's dependence away from the parents until their dependence rests solely on God. Let me say that again. I think our priority as moms and dads is to gradually transfer dependence because our children, when they are little, they depend on us for absolutely everything, don't they? And over time, our job is to help transfer their dependence to where they will no longer depend on us but instead they will depend on the one and only God, the one and only who will ever be able to completely be faithful to them, the one and only who will ever be true to them in every single way. And so we've got to teach them to depend on God. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. You might think this is a strange place to look at with regards to kids, but it's really not. It's an amazing section of Scripture that I want to spend some time looking at today. If you remember the context, text, remember what's going on here. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, Moses has just given the Ten Commandments, the ten big ones, to the children of Israel. He said, here's the ten principles that I want you guys to build your lives around, the Ten Commandments. And then right after that, Moses gives, I believe, one of the greatest teachings on parenthood in all of Scripture in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 1. Let's read that together. Now, this is the commandment the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be long. So as you teach your children to fear the Lord, as you teach them to live according to his commands, the amazing thing about this is not only will you be changed, but so will they. 
the next generation will be changed, and the generation after that generation will be different too. Because if we can train our children not to depend on us or to depend on themselves or on what they see, but instead if we can teach them to depend on the one who created everything, then and only then will we be doing exactly what God has called us to do and what God desires of us. Do you realize that as a parent, God has put within you the power to change generations? He has placed within you the power to change generation and generation and generation to come. The question is, how do we do that? Well, Deuteronomy 6 gives us, I believe, two of the most important principles that we will ever live out as a parent. And if you don't get anything else from the lesson today, these are the two things that I want you to embrace and that I want you to eternalize. This is how we transfer dependence from us to God. Here's number one. It's very simple, but it's very profound. Number one, you've got to love the Lord your God. And this begins here in verse 3 of Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, that you may multiply greatly as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Now verse 4 begins a prayer that a good Jew would recite three times a day, once in the morning, once in the afternoon and once at night. And this is something that I think is extremely important. Hear what he says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. So, verse 3 begins this amazing prayer. And in verse 5, he says, I want you to love God with everything that you have, with all of it. Now, with how much should we love the God? A little bit? A portion? A percentage? No. He says, we've got to love God with all that we have. Would you agree, though, that most of us kind of fall a little bit short of that? We seem to... Love God with a little bit here and a little bit there and maybe more on some days than on others, but all our hearts? Can I tell you that this is dangerous, especially to us as parents, to not give God everything? Because if we don't give God everything, I think we, we are setting up our children for, for failure. Let me try to explain it this way. Coming up in a couple months, what's going to happen is there's going to be a variety of people who are going to go out and get a flu shot, right? Because flu season comes along quickly. And, and, and what happens when you get a flu shot? You actually are given a little bit of the flu, aren't you? You're given a little bit of the flu so that your body can fight it off and hopefully become immune to it or, or at least be able to fight it a little bit better. Well, can I argue today that parents, so many parents, are unknowingly giving their children just a little bit of the things of God. And what happens in the process is that we're making them immune to all of His goodness. We're making them immune to all of His glory and all of His power and all of His majesty because our kids end up knowing a little bit about God, but they don't really know Him personally. They don't know Him intimately. They don't know Him in a life-changing way. Didn't Scripture just teach us that we've got to love God with all of our hearts, all of our mind, all of our soul? But the problem is, if we're just going to be honest today, is that we live in a world where there are a lot of things that distract us and carry us away from God. There are a lot of things that distract us from loving God with everything that we have. I know as a parent, as a dad, I want to provide for my kids. And so many of you want to do the same thing. You want, you want with all good intentions, to just give them more than, than maybe you were given as a kid. And you say, man, if I could just do that, that's going to be very, very valuable for my kids. And so we end up working hard, pouring ourselves into our career, trying to get, get more of the things that, that we think we need. But, but what we're doing is we're not giving our children what they really need, which is more of us. And more importantly, a deeper relationship with the only God, the only one they need to really know, and the only one who will always be there for them, and that's God alone. We want to provide them the best opportunities, and so we, we get them into soccer or baseball or ballet, and we get them into gymnastics, and we get them into this, that, and the other, and all of a sudden, we organize their schedules so that they are so amazingly busy. 
almost as busy as we are. And we work hard so that we can have a nice car to transport these children in so that they will be safe after all. And when they're 16, we want to make sure that they can get a car because in most parts of our town, not having a car at 16 would be on the borderline of child abuse. And so then we want to save up enough money so that they can get the greatest education. And before long, if we're not careful, we become child-centered parents rather than God-centered parents. And that's a problem. Before long, we become child-centered parents rather than God-centered parents. Our lives revolve around our children rather than our lives revolving around God. And that's a problem. Here's the beautiful thing about God, though. If I will center my life around God, one of the priorities that he gives me as a dad is my children. Do you, do you see that? If I will let them play second or third or fourth in my life and I'll put God where he belongs, God says, your priority as a parent is going to be your kids. <laughs> but what we do is we take God out of the picture. We just kind of throw him to the back burner and we say, no, 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 kids have to come first. Children are my priority. Children are this, that, and the other. I've had so many people in the course of my ministry who seem to be on fire for God. And then all of a sudden, they just stop coming one day. And when I catch up with them, because they don't answer the phone right away, because they know why I'm calling. <laughs> when I catch up with them or I see them at a store, the answers are remarkably similar. Oh, Steve, we've, we've just been so busy. I'm coaching Little League now, and we got our daughter in dance class, and we just seem to be going, going, going. And Sunday seemed to be the only day we can just catch up. And so we've just been too busy for church. I know we need to get back there, but, but things are just crazy right now. And when things slow down a little bit, and then I think we'll be able to, to get back. Scripture says, love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And yet, how many people simply don't have time to worship with God's parent, people and honor his name? Now, parents, please don't kid yourself. If that is you, you are sending a significant message to your children. You are saying that there are priorities in your life that are more important than God. And can I just tell you how important it is for you to be involved in church, how important it is if you want your children to be faithful, how important it is that you be involved. And let me just say by involvement in church, what I don't mean is that you come in late, you sit there for less than an hour, you leave before the invitation, and you try to beat the Baptist to Logan's. That's not involvement in church. It's just not. What that is is a spectator sport. That's not real involvement. It's just not. By involvement, I'm saying that I am a participator. I am a participant in the body of Jesus Christ. And there is a biblical function for me to do in my church. By involvement, I'm saying I am immersed in a deep, growing relationships with others in this thing called the biblical community. I'm saying by involvement that I am a contributing part to the family of God. I am plugged in. I cannot stress to you how important it is that your children see that from you, not just a Sunday morning only thing. There was a recent study that I came across, it came from a few years ago, that I thought was interesting about kids who grow up and become active Christ followers as adults. Here's what it said. If mom and dad both went to church, more than going to church, they were involved in church, then 72% of their children continued to be faithful as adults. Mom and dad both go 72% faithful. It's a pretty big number. That's, that's pretty good. That, that's exciting when you think about it. But if mom only came, dad wasn't in the picture, didn't come, didn't do anything else, that number drops from 72 to 15 percent, if mom only. This is where it gets interesting. If dad only came and mom didn't, the number climbs back up to 55 percent. Now that's not great, but wow, 55 percent. And what that tells me is dads 
Dads, don't ever underestimate the value of your role in disciplining and leading your children to know Christ. There's a reason why God places men as spiritual leaders in the house. And he's saying you have such an influence and an impact on your children that you cannot release this responsibility to your wife. This is something that you have to do. You have to own this. You have to be the one that's involved. You have to be the motivating force there. And so let me call you out today, gentlemen. Lead your families the way that God desires you to lead your families. If mom or dad neither come, only 6% of kids will ultimately be faithful Christ followers into their adult lives. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. This means not just with your words, but with your actions. And so again, let me challenge you with this today, parents. Do you love God with all of your heart or with some of your heart? Because some, just a little bit, may not be what our kids need. They need the whole counsel of God. They need the whole glory of God. Can I get something from you on that? Yes, amen. And what would happen... What would happen, say, if I walked into your house and was kind of a fly on the wall for a few weeks? What would happen if if I could just observe you without you knowing? What would it say about your commitment to God? About the magazines you read or the things sitting on your coffee table? What What would it say if I were able to watch the TV shows that you watched or look at the history log of your computer? What would those things say about your heart? What if someone just came in and listened to your language and to the conversations that go on at your house? What about your checkbook? If someone looked at your priorities and spending, what would they be saying to you? What would they be saying? There's someone who loves God with all that they have or someone who's giving less than. I'm not saying this to guilt you today, but if that's what it takes, okay. Okay. I'm saying this to challenge you to be the people of God in every way, shape, form, and fashion. You you want your kids to transfer dependence from you to God? It starts by you modeling and loving your children, loving them by loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second thing is this. We must lead our families. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and we must lead our families if we're going to transfer dependence. Take a look at verse 7. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hands and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house and on your gates. I want you to see the spiritual leadership represented in these three verses. Moses says we impress these things on our children. We talk about them when we sit at home. We talk about them when we walk along the road. We talk about them when we're driving the t-ball practice. We talk about them when we lie down and when they get up. We, We bind them as symbols all over our houses, and we actually put these on our kids. We lead our families, Moses says. This is the priority. And spiritual talk becomes not just something that we do on weekends, not just something that we do on the way to church or to youth group. Instead, it becomes a part of who we are seven days a week, 24 hours a day. You and I must lead our children spiritually. I love what Edward, Duke of Windsor, said on a trip to America. He said, the thing that impresses me most about America is the way parents obey their children. There's some truth in that. That's one of those nervous laughs, isn't it? Because you really don't know what to do other than laugh because... The thing that impresses me most is the way that parents obey their children. So here's a question. Are you leading your children or are your children leading you? Think about that. You lead them spiritually. You set the tone. You are the divine authority in the household. And some of you are looking at me right now and you're saying, Steve, I don't know how to do that. Well, what I'm not going to do today is say, here's exactly what you have to do in order to make this happen because I don't know what that looks like in your family. 
I have an idea of what it looks like in mind, but what I'm going to tell you, and I want you to write this down, if you're going to lead your family, you must be intentional about it. You must lead them intentionally. Back in Mission Viejo, before we came here, we had some dear friends, Dave and Lindsay Henderson. And one of the things that we got together and did is that we're going to have some intentional things with our kids about training them and, and trying to, to move them in God's direction. We got serious. We met every other week or every week for a while, and, and we would hold each other accountable. And we'd say, how'd you do with praying for your kids this week? How'd you do with talking with them on, uh, as you were driving? How'd you do with this? And we, we would we made all kinds of things and for months we just wanted to be intentional about leading our children into God and the way God wants us to and it was a great thing and then we stopped (laughs) I know how hard it is to make this a consistent thing but if we're going to lead we've got to do it intentionally and so whatever that means for you seek it with all your heart and pray to God about what does this look like for my family and I guarantee you that he's going to give you the things that you need to be the parents that you want to be remember you set the tone you set the standards I heard the story I love this about a single mom who was struggling with knowing what to do with her teenager. Her teenager always wanted to go see these R-rated movies with his friends, and, and he said, Mom, but there's just a little bit of bad stuff, just a little bit. It's not that bad. And so Mom was praying, God, what do I do with this? And she said God gave her an idea, something I thought was pretty clever. She said, I'll tell you what, son, you can go see the R-rated movie, but first you have to help me make brownies. And the teenager was like, okay, I love brownies. He says, I'll do that as long as I get to lick the bowl. And she said, sure, you can lick the bowl. But what I need you to do to contribute to the brownie making process is I want you to go out into the yard and find some of our dog's poop. And I want you to give me just one spoonful of dog poop. And the son was like, mom, that's nasty. Come on, I'm not going to do that. She said, no, 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 really, just one small scoop. That's all you need. Just bring that in, help me make the brownies, and you can go to the show tonight. And the son was like, well, whatever. And he came in with a spoonful of dog poop, and he was holding it out like this. <laughs> and he gave it to his mom, and the mom said, oh, no, 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 that's way too much. And so she took a little knife, and she, and she cut, it, cut it in half, and she dropped just a little bit of dog poop down into the brownie mix and stirred it up. And he said, Mom, we can't eat that. She said, oh, sure we can. And so she poured it into a bigger bowl, and she said, would you like to lick the bowl now? And he's like, ain't no way I'm doing that. That's downright disgusting. And she said, but what you don't understand, son, is it's just a little bit of dog poop. And all of a sudden, the young man realized that just a little bit of ungodliness is probably too much. If your heart is wholly surrendered to God. Parents, that means that you are in charge. And just because everyone else is doing it doesn't mean it's the right standard for you and your family. Let me say this with love. You are not supposed to be so concerned about your children's immediate happiness as much as you are to be concerned about their holiness and full pursuit of God in every single way. These guys are like, oh, what is this guy doing to me? He's killing me right now. I want to say that again because that's huge. You are not supposed to be so concerned about your child's immediate happiness as much as you are their holiness and full pursuit of God in every single way. So what do we do? How do we lead them? Well, the Bible calls this training And it was from that very well-known section of Scripture that that Patrick read for us that Scripture says that we are to train our children. Proverbs 22, 6, we train our children in the way that they should go. When they're old, they will not depart from that. And the Hebrew word for train there is very, very interesting. The Hebrew word is actually called shanak or kanak. And the word actually means the palate of your mouth. And in order to understand how this all fits together, what would happen in Old Testament times when an Israelite woman would have a baby, the Hebrew midwife would be there and they would take her finger and they would dip it into this paste and then they would put this paste on the palate of the baby's mouth, on the kanak. And what this would do is it would initiate a hunger within the child so that the baby would then want to nurse. 
And that's what we as parents are supposed to do. We chanak, we train, we initiate, we dedicate, we train our children in the way that they should go. We initiate in them a hunger for that which is true and right and pure and holy. And when they see the fruit of that, they see that godly living works and that godly living is exactly what God wants from us. And our role, remember, is to transfer dependence. And so as they begin to see this more and more and more, they no longer depend on us. Now they depend on God for the things that they need. So we transfer dependence by loving God. And it starts with us initially, intentionally leading our families and then training them. If you want to half-heartedly let life happen, let me promise you, life will happen. And you will kiss your kids goodbye. You'll send them off to college. You'll walk them down the aisle. And then you're going to wonder, where in the world did it all go? Lead them. Lead them. You lead. You lead. God placed you in that role. And so love God with all your heart and lead as he calls you to lead. And we do that by training. I want to give you a list, just seven things that I found just kind of quickly flipping through Proverbs. Seven of the most important things that we as parents can train our children. This is simply from Proverbs, and I'm just going to throw them out there quickly because we're running low on time. Here's number one. First thing we should train our kids, we should initiate a hunger in our kids to manage God's money wisely. This is what Proverbs tells us, some of the things that we need to be training our children to manage God's money. Because remember, it's his, it's not mine. I'm a steward of what he's given me, all right? It's not mine until I give it back to him. It's all his, and I'm giving him what's already his. So we need to train our children to manage God's money. We need to train our children to carefully select their friends. Proverbs is huge about this. From chapter 1 to chapter 31, there's ideas and principles and concepts about teaching them to train them to carefully select the people they're going to hang with. Number three, we should train our children to be responsible. Number four, we should train our children to guard their minds. Number five, we should train our children to be generous. And the only way they're going to see that is if they see us being generous, if they see us guarding our minds, if they see us being responsible, that's going to transfer to them. It's going to be a way to create a hunger in them that's not going to be able to be quenched. Number six, we should train our children to always respect God. And number seven, we should train our children to love them with all their hearts, minds, soul, and strength. I want you to know something as we wrap this up. This church, the Beltline Church of Christ, is very, very, very serious about partnering with you to lead your children to become fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. This church calls our children a priority, and it shows in the things that we do and in the way that we plan and that kind of stuff. But honestly, it's not our job. It's not Scott's job. Honestly, it's your job. We'll partner with you. We want to do that. We love you. We want to help. We want to be there. We want to, we want to, we want to encourage you. We want to cheer you on. We want to pick you up when you fall. But it's your job, honestly. And you will be successful, not simply by exposing your kids to all the great activities, as important as those are, but you'll be successful if you expose your children to the great truths of God. If you teach them about His power, His goodness, teach them about the power of prayer, teach them about the truth of His Word, teach them about the power of His Spirit that can lead us and counsel us and guide us and correct us and be our teacher. So what do we do? We transfer their dependence on us. Because when they're young, they depend on us completely. But when they are older, we want them not to depend on their friends or on themselves. We want to teach them to depend on God. This will not happen by accident. It will not happen by accident. None of it. The most important thing that I do is not stand up here and preach sermons to you. The most important thing that I can do right now is lead my children to Jesus Christ. Because if I am blessed to get to participate and help build an amazing church, but I lose my kids, I'm going to feel like a failure. The most important thing that I will ever do is lead them to the one who gave his life for them. And when they know who they are in Christ, then 
then they are ready to be shot out into this world. And I guarantee you, they will make a difference. Parents, your role is absolutely important. You can train. You can change generation and generation and generation to come. The question is, are you going to love the Lord your God with all your heart? And are you going to train them the way God has called you to lead them? I pray that you will. And if you just need this church to come around you today and help you in that, we're here for you. We want to pray with you. We want to be here for you. We want to be your, the, the hands and feet of Jesus to help you in any way possible that we can. If you're, uh, if you're not a Christian, the best thing that you can do to be exactly what God wants you to be is give your life to him first. Let your kids see that. Let them see your priority is God, and, and that's going to train them in ways that you cannot possibly imagine. Oh, I hope that we can pray for you, that we can help you today. We certainly desire to be God's people and we hope that that is your desire as well. If we can help you pray for you, we invite you to come while together we stand and we sing this song for your encouragement. Dead.